Today our speaker is Dr. Vimla Patel. Uh, she's a clinical professor in our department here, the Department of Biomedical Informatics. Uh, she's also a senior research scientist uh, at the New York Academy of Medicine, where she's the director of the Center for Cognitive Studies in Medicine <coughs> and Public Health. Uh, she was formerly a professor uh, in the School of Biomedical Informatics at the University of Texas, uh, as well as a professor here uh, in this department. Uh, and she was also a uh, professor of biomedical informatics at Columbia. Uh, she's an expert in medical cognition, medical reasoning, decision making, patient safety, medical errors, and cognition and education. Thank so you. Today she'll speak to us on <laughs> team decision making. <coughs> Thank you. It's really great to be here. Um, at, you know, after so, after so long, I was here for so many years and I went back and now I'm going back and forth. So. <coughs> this is nice to come and give a seminar, at least on the work that we have been doing, work that we started here actually initially, and then continued over the years. I'm very persistent. When I start on something, I usually don't let go easily. No matter how many years it takes, it's got to c come to a fruition, come to publication, and this is what it shows in this work. This study is this. What I'm presenting today is three big papers, actually three big studies and trying to put it all together to tell a story, a particular story that I'm just going to pick up one thread through all three stories and how we started. <clears throat> so a lot of details in each one, but I'm not going to go into that, okay? Let's get that. <clears throat> okay, so there is this uh, conventional notion of error that we all know that uh, anybody who makes an error or supposedly makes an error, he or she is accountable for. You know, you make a mistake, you are accountable for. And you are is a single person who's always blamed because you're negligent. And that sort of theme is changing now, <coughs> that um, more moving away from that. And the second thing is that per se that human that error should be completely eliminated, there should be, you know, zero tolerance for error. This is basically a conventional wisdom that we should should have no errors, remove every error possible so that we have a safer place. The challenging thing is, of course, we all know from our Institute of Medicine reports that the framework for individual accountability is not about the individual self, but the whole systemic issue. There could be many things that can go wrong that can affect you, not just the person, the person who actually was the last person responsible for making the error. The error can, human error cannot be eliminated. The one conventional person cannot completely eliminate. You can manage it, you can reduce it, but you can't eliminate it. There's a, error plays a role in, in our lives, in a way. And recovering, making an error, recovering from it, it's a part of your daily activity. It's a kind of your cognitive activity. So what role does it play? It's, you know, most often you learn from making errors and learning on the job, learning on the training, it's a part of it. So I want to focus a little bit more on that part of it. So there is another um, uh, issue out there, which is how do you become an expert in any domain? For years we believed in and we continue to believe in it. It makes a lot of intuitive sense that you are start off being a novice, uh, somebody who starts beginning in any area, then you become an expert. The more time you spend on it, the years you spend on it, you become better and better. And hopefully that you, you become better in year two than you in year one, and year three even even more, much better than the year, year before. Hopefully that's how it increases, and expertise increases with ex as performance you do, and less and you make less and less errors. So if you're an expert, you're less likely to make more errors. This basically goes with the wisdom. Okay. Now, that kind of wisdom is changing rapidly. We now, it's been looks like it that, that Basically, the actual performance goes down before it actually goes straight, which means that people make more and more errors if they become expert. But the ability to detect and correct is pretty fast. It's pretty good. So what you really say is, is that you have to be able to uh, not only make errors, but detect them and correct them very fast, which changes the role. It plays against the conventional wisdom that you, not, you should not be making errors. So given that backdrop, <coughs> Trevor Cohen and I, when we were here uh, at Biomedical Informatics, both of us were here full time, 
<coughs> we produced this paper on uh, um, current opinions in critical care, which developed a framework for errors and boundaries of risk on which our whole of our th all these studies for a number of years been based on. <coughs> Basically, what it says is that how does an error progress in any environment, development of an error? The one is that a physician or a clinician goes around doing their routine job, just it's like any routine job, and suddenly it hits a boundary and it's almost missed it and said, you know, I'm almost made an error, but I really did, but I just corrected it. So you're hitting a boundary here, and then you are going to the next level and uh, hit another boundary and that you actually have an adverse event because you actually missed it. So you have two boundaries. One is you made an error, but you quickly corrected it, checked it. The near miss, or one that's an adverse boundary, basically. And that's, that's uh, uh, an adverse event. The first boundary is the violation of consensual uh, bounds of safe practice. There are evidence-based practices, practice guidelines. When you violate that, you almost go into that boundary. The second one is you're able to detect it and correct it. So they are the practice guidelines of violations of safe practice, and then you correct it here. These are the two boundaries. And this is the period that we are particularly interested in. So we're looking at how people um, detect errors, correct errors, <coughs> and um, uh, explain, explain the errors is the error recovery period. This is a very important period between you either almost missing it or you actually not, uh, that you're actually correcting it, or it ends up in an adverse event. This is a very, this is a particular period that we are interested in. <coughs> Given this backdrop, <coughs> <coughs> so in summary, the analysis of near misses provides an opportunity to characterize what, what drives people. So when people are near missing it, what made you near miss it? What, what drove you to it? What are, the, what are the factors that pushed you towards it? Can you make it more explicit, something that is so implicit, you don't know about it? What made you? Because you had not enough sleep last night? Did you have too many things going on? You were interrupted constantly? Uh, you just um, uh, were out of it, whatever reason? You didn't have enough knowledge, maybe. But whatever happened, that's the part that um, boundary, and how do you negotiate to recover from this thing? Okay? That's the boundary we're interested in. And making this boundary mostly visible to decision makers so that you know, reduce, reduce the problems that are actually pushing you to making these errors. <coughs> making effort to counteract pressures that drive decision makers towards these boundaries. That's the whole idea. <coughs> and uh, technological support in healthcare based on understanding of this boundary that lead to her human errors. Once we understand what it is that we're dealing with here, then we can say, what kind of support can we provide? How best can we provide technological support to reduce it, knowing pretty well that technology can help us do that, deal with this. <coughs> <coughs> so now the whole studies of error detection and correction this is what I was talking about, that people, expectation of people, that if you're an expert, you should be completely free of errors, you should be, it's, it's a myth of an infallible expert. <coughs> Public perception is that there is malpractice if you don't, if you make a mistake, there is this in the media, an expectation of flawless performance, it can have a quite significant consequences of that. And then personal perception is that perception of error associated with the burnout, emotional stress, all kinds of personal implications for that. So you try and avoid saying, oh, I don't make any errors, or I'm not supposed to make any errors, because it's not acceptable to say, I made a mistake and how we correct it. <clears throat> There's a lot of these problems that, that's, that makes it very hard for us to <clears throat> deal with making errors. So the series of studies, we embarked on a series of three studies over a period. The first one started here at BMI and working in collaboration with Banner Health System uh, with uh, Mark Smith, who is sitting in the back there, and uh, Bafa Gemagami, who has also worked with us. And the idea of these whole studies were funded by, uh, are continued to be funded by James S. McDonald Foundation from St. Louis, Missouri, on complexity and error in critical care. Critical care here meaning uh, both 
ER and ICU, actually. <clears throat> so better understand the mechanism by which errors are detected and corrected. The interesting thing is that there was European transportation system, and there are many other aviation area. They picked this up long before we did. They actually recognized, and they're always ahead of us. Uh, and that that the experts not that they don't make mistake, but they actually detect and correct it faster. So, and then we picked up the idea from it and decided that maybe we'll test out in medicine <coughs> to investigate strategy for error management and risk assessment as a function of. Uh, expertise in such environments and support and suggest appropriate empirical based intervention tools to support error detection. <coughs> there are two, excuse me, I've got a little sore throat so I'm kind of itching. There are two kinds of studies. One is the um, perspective, which is you do it ahead of time, you know, attempt to capture recovery and process through real time. What's exactly going on in real world? know, go ahead and capture the data. And it's audio recording of things and lots of data. It's a labor intensive, it's a lot of work. And you have a, a lot of data and you have to shift through to find one or two critical things. But those things are very important because they give you a context for what exactly happened at that moment. But it's a lot of data analysis, but you have to have some kind of good theoretical framework to be able to analyze data. Uh, if you don't analyze it well, you've got a data dump, a whole lot of you don't have to do about. Second thing in retrospective, which most often you hear, what happened after the case. In airline, you don't know what happened. You always hear the plane crashed and we're going to hear after the fact what exactly happened here, retrospective. And uh, it, you learn a lot from it because there's troubleshooting exactly what happened. However, it's, um, the problem is it's vulnerable to biases because if it happens after the fact, you have, you know, you have rebuilt biases because things went wrong, therefore everything is interpreted with respect to something going wrong. So both methods have pos you know, positive effects and negative things. You need a combination of both for, and also it, the question you're asking. It all depends on the question you're asking. <coughs> but remember in the airline industry you also have, they say, this is a tentative results, but we are waiting to hear from the, the, the black box. Once we get the black box, we'll tell you exactly what happened. So that's when we don't have a black box in medicine like that. So I was at Columbia. This is before I came to Arizona State at uh, uh, Columbia University in biomedical informatics. And I had read about this article in aviation and European transportation system. So I thought, you know what, I would go. Uh, Tate Kabuse was my postdoc at that time. And I said, well, let's just go into ICU and we'll just follow one of the clinicians there, and let's just collect some data. Let's just see if we can even see in our pilot data. So this was collected <coughs> for three days, observations and audio recording ICU with one uh, uh, ICU physician, and errors by subject and level of expertise. So we got one expert, one resident, and a student. And we just collected the data real time, the whole lot, and quick analysis of that. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that um, experts detected 18 errors within a particular time period, recovered from 50. So he would be talking, and suddenly he would be correcting himself, saying, did I just say that? No, that's not what I meant. Change that. Or somebody will else something saying, OK, that looks, sounds good, but I'm not so sure that's a really best idea. Let's do that. So very quickly, not only his own errors, but errors of the others in the team. So there's a difference between the two. Resident detected eight correct, uh, detected 13, corrected 18, uh, eight. Student detected eight and corrected two. The thing is that all it told me was that maybe this is probably true in medicine too, what we're looking at other industry, maybe something more generic. <clears throat> this meant that we needed more careful study, more carefully done, and see exactly what it is and when people make errors. So that led us to trying to discover a model from which we can use to do such studies. <coughs> this is a seven-stage model of error recovery. It's not really error recovery. It's Don Norman, who's a very well-known um, cognitive scientist as well as a, an advocate for one of the, this particular model that he developed, and a guy named Elwood, who also used some of the medical aspect to it and, 
and particularly with respect to risk assessment. So this was put together, and this is Trevor and my concoction of what originally started with these two people. So basically what it is is that um, usually when Don Norman talks about it, it's a human, human computer interface. This is an interface, this is a technology, and there's the human part of it. So you have a goal for something, and then you um, decide to take an action. You specify the corrective action, you execute it, then you, and the error, perceive the error, you interpret the error, you evaluate it, okay? So where we're gonna focus on this part of it is um, this particular part here, the interpret perception, interpretation, and evaluation. This is the model we use generically. So here it is, we have three studies. So initially we decided uh, with the help of Banner system, and the studies were conducted at Banner. Um, we developed uh, with the clinicians, with the help of clinicians, particularly Wafa Gamagami, uh, Dr. Gamagami, developed two cases: the <coughs> the suspected uh, divicular colitis and sharp trauma. What it really meant was taking two cases that were most common in the ICU at the time that were seen, then modifying it little by introducing errors in it. So you have a case, modified a little bit so it doesn't look like any common thing, and then embedding certain errors. Uh, so the so idea was that was presented in a paper to individual um, subjects. So we had a number of residents and clinicians. They gave them this thing and said, would you please read it and, um, and evaluate for us what's going on here? Refers to patient, patient subject is not primed in any way to say there's something wrong with it, nothing at all. Everything was audio recorded, each one. Each one was done individually, there's no team. Individual error detection and correction, okay? No team at all. And very much of a controlled experimentation in the hospital in a separate room. And just quickly, without going into too much detail, what the cases look like and what the errors look like without describing in details the errors. So basically, this was the case one. In this particular case, an inappropriate antibiotics was given. And this, then the, the, the colonoscopy that was given was contraindicated in this particular case. Uh, and the third problem was that uh, urethral stent are not placed. It should have been placed in this case. Um, I'm not going to go into the medical part of it, but uh, just going to explain, because I want to get into the error section of it. No x-ray before the CT scan was give, done here because x-ray could have found certain problems, the CT scan was necessary. And uh, the, the finally, they did not diagnose the uterine injury in this particular case, which should have been. So once this was, um, uh, errors were identified, uh, and what could have been the alternative explanation for these errors, were done in detail. So just, you know, just to give you a quick breakdown on it, it's a picture of it to kind of see what exactly, in the physiological sense, what it, in an anatomical sense, what it looks like. And the second one in this particular case, one of them particularly, hmm. <clears throat> it was, did not rule out pericardial injury by sonogram. This should have been. Uh, second one was did not explore a zone one hematoma. And again, the basically just a physiological explanation. The participants were all from um, Banner Health System here with Arizona and St. Louis Hospital in Missouri. Two groups of people, two subjects with it. We had um, Joanna Olson, who was a nurse here in the nursing school and NBMI, one of my students. She went to um, St. Louis to collect the data. Characteristics where most of the people had expertise five to ten years. Some of them had, and the, most of them were also three years, so they're residents and experts, and number of participants, as you can see, total. So basically, we have demographics of these people as well. Um, basically, average was that. Um, and prediction was that <coughs> experts will detect and recover from majority of errors based on what we know in aviation, in other industry. That's what we will predict. Okay. So what happened? I won't go into detail of the analysis, everything. It's all given in the, in the papers there. 
Um, no error detection by more than 50% of the subjects, regardless of expertise. So it wasn't so good. You know, wasn't so good. And that sort of scared us a little bit. We reanalyzed it. We did a second line of spot check, analyzed. So one thing we could think about is that the environment, the experiment is quite constrained. You are looking at somebody else's who is doing the evaluation. You are evaluating it. It's a very different situation than real time. Okay, so we decided to move forward, and I said, okay, we learned something from it. So lower than expected rate of detection. Uh, although attack, attending detected and corrected more errors. And they made it quickly on the fly. So at least it was in the right direction, but still wasn't significant, not enough to say that that's what might happen when you have experts. And um, so we decided that, so this whole paper is published uh, in 2011 uh, in Journal of Biomedical Informatics. So we decided what do we do next. And uh, so this is what it is. So we have a control experimentation paper based here, but we call in vitro. And then we have the real world audio recordings of in vivo, what, what really happens there. And then you have somewhere in between. So we decided we'll carefully move towards it. We will do an in-between experiment where we will have it actually in the ICU rounds. But this time, we will not let them be the real patients. We will again use this text and, uh, but it will be announced by the attending during the round and say, look, uh, this is a case developed by, uh, this is a problem that occurred in another hospital, and I want you to read it and see what you think of the patient management and come up with alternatives if you have any. And so this was done at the Texas Medical Center at the Herman Memorial, Memorial Herman, and um, second study, oopsie, okay. The objective was of this error management, the clinical. This time it's a team decisions. It was a whole team because usually you work in team. So we moved away from single to team. One thing was clear, that teams, the individuals don't do so well. At least one the experiment. This paper is almost it's ready. It's been just about, actually, just went out for publication. And it's a second study which says, you know, teamwork and error in critical care is their safety in numbers. Okay. Now, so this was to understand the team dynamics to see if teams do make a difference in any way. So study site was the Memorial Hermann Intensive Care Unit, Medical Intensive Care. Two different cases were developed, uh, diabetic keto ketoacidosis and GI bleeding. This was the most common two problems that occurred in the ICU, okay? Again, very similar. And then errors were embedded once again in the two cases and subjects were not primed once again. Uh, instruction was, so here it is, you go in the morning rounds, um, just before you go into the patient room, everybody's standing around, and the attending said, um, here is the case that happened, problem that happened in another hospital. I want you to evaluate the given case in the team and present the assessment in your plan. What do you think? Have an open discussion, have an open dialogue that you normally do at the bedside. All right, so they discussed it. This was one case, I'll just quickly go over. Uh, without going into details, these were some of the errors that were embedded in each one. Um, wrong choice of antibiotic once again. Um, we identified a priori, we identified each, we went through it in great details, got more than one clinician to check it to make sure um, it was correct and uh, that there were not too many alternatives. One error here had a possibility of an alternative. But for the purpose of what we are doing, it was fine. So we did five clinical teams, five rounds, five different times to make sure consistency. The team included interns, residents, fellows who were posted during ICU in that, during that month. Audio recordings of the microphone, we had observers in the team taking notes. We had, um, now we're living more sophisticated, instead of handwritten notes, we're using iPads and the kind of information that we were using, using ontology that we had. And also the, uh, everything was minute microphone, we had placed various places. Everything was approved by IRB, willing to do, that was all taken care of. Um, subject demographic, again, we had 32 subjects in this case, recording according to level of training, and we had most residents, few fellows, mostly interns. 
uh, by gender. Um, we had more females in the first two rounds and less females in the other ones. This started to make a difference when you're starting to look at number of discussions you have. Females tend to have more dialogue than, than the males do in the particular case. So, but we don't have enough data to support completely what we found, but it does look a difference in gender. Um, so data analysis, we transcribed it. We got independent two coders looking at it in data reliability and checked by the third. And the incidence of error detection, error collection, and when they corrected the error, we wanted them to explain why. Why do you think it was a mistake? And correct a justification. And then we also coded for uh, how many, much of the information that was given to them was called recall, exactly the same as it was in the text, and how much they actually inferred from it and make their own inferences, because it makes a difference as to what it is. And the request, they'll say, I'm sorry, we cannot decide. I need additional information at this stage. So coding scheme, basically, we went by proposition by proposition. This is the resident number or the, uh, of the clinician number, the inferences that were built upon, things that were exactly recorded exactly as it was, uh, and things, persons who had made further requests and justification. So each of the dial, each of the interaction was coded in great detail, labor intensive, almost took a year to just code, uh, and then so what did we find? We found this, that for the total, all five teams, rounds, the error detection was high, error correction was reasonably good, error justification was good. We found basically there were more errors detected, more errors corrected, more justified than we had <coughs> in the individual. So teams do help to detect, correct, and um, uh, justify, kind of help you justify error, one thing. Let's take a look at it. So, now, one thing we found is that percentage of error detected and, and corrected as the interactive episode. For example, if you take one thread, one important um, error question, and number of times you go around and round around that error and say, oh, well, maybe we could have done this, maybe not, maybe we should have done that. Perhaps the person should have been stabilized. Patient should have, see, more discussion you have, the as the number of episodes of discussion increase, you've got more chances of error being corrected. So if you have more dialogue about a particular point, a particular issue, more likely to detect and correct errors. So in other words, team discussion uh, promotes error detection and error correction because you help each other. Somebody says something, somebody picks it up, and we show in a detailed dialogue how actually this happens. Okay, so definitely, Teams do help in correct errors because you pick up each other's errors. So teams did make a difference in error detection and correction. However, something we weren't expecting to find, if they keep on talking about, so after a while they make a difference, and if they keep on discussing, talking more and more and more and more, the further they do away from the patient, they start to make new errors that we haven't even identified didn't even exist, completely new errors that wasn't even given originally in the text. So more dialogue, because more discussion you have, the chances of you getting in more errors are higher. Okay? So what happens in this case? Let me give you an example of just how we coded for such errors. This is just a legend for, you know, circle is a sort of color code for a resident, and we have inferences and conversation and text information, and then all the codes with yellow is a detection of errors that was presented in the case. The green was the generation, the um, new errors generated, and the um, new errors generated that escape correction, that doesn't get corrected. So when new errors get generated, some get corrected and some don't get corrected. Just want to show you, uh, without going into detail, how coding was done for each of the complete dialogue, just to show you it was quite detailed. We sort of went through this dialogue. These are the residents or the team members, team member two, team member six, team five, one, whoever that is. You can see there's something is iterative, something they get picked up over and over again. So as we move forward here, so here in this particular case, we have a new error generated, okay, in this case. And then you keep forwarding, move forward as they're killing, 
New era get generated, uh, corrected, and then new error gets generated here. So question is, when it gets generated, when it gets corrected, when it's not being corrected, and uh, when it's just detected, are all tracked within this thing. And we can see who's the person initiating it, who's the person. So that kind of coding mechanism tells us a great detail as to what point in time these errors are generated, what point in time these errors are corrected, and when they are not corrected, and escapes it, and does it get into patient care? Now, this is a question. When errors don't get corrected, what happens to them? So if you go back to our original model, um, 16 new errors were generated during discussion, okay, brand new errors that we were not expecting. 10 were checked, 10 were corrected by somebody picked up saying, hold on, hold on here, that's not right. Other six were unchecked, okay? Now, these six, uh, of the nine, that nine were corrected here, and the one um, that were not completely corrected, but all the partly corrected. And the thing is that there's a potential for these errors to get into patient care. If you're treating the patient or caring, potential. Did it really get into patient care? We don't know because they did not exactly, because we are doing it in a condition where it doesn't matter. Okay? But had great potential of getting into the thing. Now there's also a difference between which errors were generated, corrected, in terms of whether they're procedural errors or they are knowledge-based errors. Knowledge-based errors more often were corrected. Some of the other ones were not as corrected. It's very interesting. I'm not describing the detail. I just want to pick up a thread. How did you identify the errors? I mean, what was the expertise of that? Was well, we had all clinical expertise on that one. So first of all, the transcribers, we transcribed it all data. Uh, we coded it from uh, people who are non-physicians, people, team members, as to everyone that we connect, uh, corrected as error detection, error correction, everything. Transcription, once we did it, it went back to the clinicians. The clinicians, uh, Khalid Al Musa and Bella Patel, they went through the, all the transcriptions, every detail, and corrected it. Some of them, you know, medical errors were really quite a number, so they corrected, they corrected everything. Then we identified the errors, and they looked over it, and they made corrections to it, and they want to say, this is not an error, really. When I'll say, well, this is an error, there's one more that you missed. So we went a number of rounds of it to making sure we're quite correct, and uh, collected all those errors, corrected them, and then we identified them, each one of them. And some of interesting thing, these were the clinicians who were attending at the time, and yet they said, you know something, we didn't pick it up. They hadn't recognized, because, you just, because too many things were going on at the time. and it depends and, or disagreement among clinicians about whether it's really an error? There were a couple of them that were uh, an issue, whether, um, uh, can't remember which one it was, a couple of them whether it could be or maybe this alternative therapy is quite acceptable these days. Uh, maybe, you know, we don't know. Modern, is jury is still out on it, but one would accept it in this condition, you know. So there is, there are a couple of them like that. Um, given that, still the trend is pushing towards. Okay. So yes, yes, there is a couple of them where people had to argue, but I'm not quite sure about that. I presented it to Columbia, so Columbia physician looked at it, and they're the ones who said, well, I don't know, I could do go that the other way. You know? So that's fine. So there is, there is going to be. You know, it's not, we call it all error because that's how it's counted as error. Normally, is if that was a mistake and got in in the patient, something happened to the patient, that we consider an error. So if that's an error, we consider an error, even though it might be negotiation. You know, just simple. It's the thing. Uh, so this is the study. Uh, oopsie, pardon me. <laughs> this is going the wrong way. No, this is not it. Okay, let's go back. Uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way. It looks like okay. Uh, going the right way now. Huh. I don't know what's happening here. Yeah, maybe I'm, I'm going the right way now. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a, a third study. We actually have just gotten the 
draft of the manuscript together. So this is about um, study about the uh, real world naturalistic. Go two more back. Okay. So now we did study in the paper based. Uh, we did study in the semi naturalistic in between, and now we are in the in vivo. I wanted to go in the real world now. Let's take what's really happening at the bedside. Now there's no control because we've got so many patients. You know, altogether we have 35 patients in this three round. So there's no patient control. But we are capturing what exactly is happening in the team discussion for each patient. At the same time, we are working on collecting a virtual world of how to train people to detect and correct errors in the virtual ICU. So while I'm continuing in this study, Trevor Cowan picked up on the virtual world. So he's working on the virtual world aspect of the same ICU that we're working on at, um, uh, at the University of Texas at Houston at the uh, Memorial Hermann. And we are working with this one here in the observation. So we decided we'll go in the real world and collect the real data. As people go in, the attending takes the patient along. Okay. So this was the paper. It's just a draft of a manuscript. It's just as I speak, it's almost ready, but just a draft. It's not completely ready yet. Um, so what we did was we collected the, the patients were at the bedside, and the, the, the team was at the bedside as normal. The continued discussion, bed by bed by bed by 19 beds, 16 beds, 25 beds, whatever, total of 35 patients at, or during three rounds, three sets of rounds. We took all the details of every, and this time we coded for dialogue actually dialogue analysis, <coughs> very detailed dialogue analysis, utterances. When do people transcript who, did, who said what, what did they say, and then when was it that there was information management, uh, information aggregation, when was it information loss, uh, misinterpretation, interpretation, every one of them, and the type of error, that error was detected or corrected or generated, and interpretation that was given. Very, very detailed. Alisa Shine, who's been working with us, and and people from Colombia who are expert on this one, so we got that. It's really very much of a, a real, true to life, um, um, uh, what we call grounded theory approach. You take a set of data initially, you do a coding, and then you see which trend is going and do the rest of it. Really detailed analysis. So basically, a dialogue. And this is, and based on the dialogue, each dialogue set, we looked at illustrative examples of the decision structure of a segment. For example, we would build as to how the dialogue would continue, then what, who will pick up which dialogue, what will happen, when will the errors be generated, when will it be detected, uh, when, would be, when somebody will pick it up, whether you pick it up your own error while you're talking about or somebody else's, because that makes a difference. The cognitive implication for both of us are very different. Whether you have a metacognitive skill or your ability to detect somebody else's, they're somewhat different. And how they pick it up and what happens. So this is the kind of network we develop over a period of time. So this is an example of team one, bed one. Now, so totally, number of errors generated, corrected, and unresolved by teams. So we had three days, one, two, and three days. And uh, these are the percentage of errors generated, 91% uh, um, errors generated. Remember, there's no control. You don't have a text. It is generated just by the very nature you're talking. You know, you can't believe that, that can errors can be generated that much. But it is a whole 19, whatever, total bed or whatever, 53, or 35. Um, but 10%, um, the number 91 and 10%, 68 and so on and so forth, and total of 273 in respect to all the percent, whatever. Correct numbers, corrected errors, 59% with from the 91 and 32% were unresolved. So you can see the number of unresolved. But this is the highest, highest um, generated, highest corrected errors. So basically what happens is that you correct this in this environment, really in vivo, they corrected more, they generated more, they corrected more, and uh, there's some unresolved ones, but they definitely generated and corrected more. An op so something's happening in real world environment that we are not capturing in any other. Something, what, what's, what's really happening there? Because that's what we are after here. So <clears throat> basically, most errors were generated and corrected by the attending. So this is exactly what I found in my pilot study at Columbia. 
And this data is collected in another hospital altogether. So even though our study has constraints of one ICU, maybe two ICUs, very limited, particular attending and a particular clinician who was there at the time, given the constraints of that, the trend is quite robust. <coughs> if we can extend it to other environment, that attending made most, resident generated a lot, but didn't correct as many. The, the constraint by the time, because you're a real world, you have to really move forward. There were more errors generated and corrected in the first beds than the later beds, because you are having less utterances, because you don't have enough time. Now you're running out of time, so you talk less, and less likely to be generated. That kind of seems to be the natural thing happening. It's definitely. Now this is also very s synonymous to another situation where when you have dialogues, when you have discussion, uh, teams discuss with various levels of expertise in view to learn, in view to do things. If you don't have somebody watching over you as a team leader, correcting you as you, if you make a mistake, you don't learn. Because whatever your mistake goes through, even if you're not doing patient care, you don't learn. Team leader seems it's a very critical stage. And this is the same thing for general learning and problem-based learning. When problem-based learning, approach to learning came into being rather than just lecture, one thing became very important that if you did not have a team leader that will monitor you and correct you, then it's a problem. And that became very expensive because they had small group teaching everywhere, and you know, a team leader was a content expert. Where are you going to find all of that? That went on for years. I remember my, you know, another life when I was dealing with this kind of work. And this is very similar to this was happening here. And really critical evidence that team leader is important for the teaching and learning because these are teaching rounds as well. Teaching and learning. And another thing that's looking, it looks more and more that at the, at the bedside itself, you are more interested in making sure the patient is stabilized, patient is okay, and move on. You don't give as much opportunity to learn. You need to create alternative opportunities to be able to pick up on near misses and create such a thing. I could think of many reasons how technology would play a great role in this one. So now let's look at all three studies. Number of errors generated in the laboratory based and number of errors corrected, percentage, as you can see, errors propagated or unresolved. Laboratory based situation tells us something about um, how individuals detect errors, correct errors, how many bi nature of biases they have. But doesn't tell you anything what's happened in the real world at all, far from it. But let's, let's show you the trend. This is closer to that one, a little bit better than the other one. But in vivo, what really is happening, you really need to study what's happening out there, real time. You know, and based, build simulations based on it. You can do these other kinds of things. You can simulate for use for training purposes, be it for education purposes. But they have to be mimic here, not so much mimic in that environment. But each study tells you something. It's not like they're a waste of time. They give you information because you're better control over certain things. You can control over the same text with different people. Here you don't have that. The patient variation was only due to the fact that somebody was seen earlier or somebody was seen later. That would make a difference here. So comparatively, you have. Wait, can, can you back, back that slide just one second? Pardon? It's a bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. On the middle one, it says number of errors generated and number of errors corrected. So it's number of errors generated and uh, number of errors okay, that were corrected. For. So I, I, yeah, no, my it's correct. This is the next slide will probably be clearer, perhaps, is that um, in the laboratory base, which is the green in vitro, um, that were corrected and that were unresolved, that was quite high in the, in, in the, in the laboratory base. And semi-naturalistic was the next one, and the third one was the in vivo. A lot more corrected and a fewer got propagated into the unresolved fuel got propagated through the system. But we do know one thing, is that because they were done at the bedside, if these, some of these, uh, which you're working on now, some of these uh, things that were unresolved actually could have patient care implications. Not all of them, but some of them. You know, at least more than 50% we identified. Physicians are working on that right now. Um, 
So summary of results is that clinical teams at the bedside optimize performance. This minimizes learning because there isn't really that much time. You know, there used to be time that we didn't have so many, um, so many patients and had clinical team with plenty of time. You don't have that anymore. Things are crowded. There are a lot more patients to see. Uh, and so we don't have as much time. You know, Oslerian tradition was learning by the bedside because you had fewer patients you could spend. Times have changed. How can we capitalize on this kind of environment? How can technology play a role in simulation, building something to help something like that? Since the trainee consistently made more errors than corrections, not enough time for making errors to learn from the mistakes, because you need to allocate. Do you mean, do you mean minimize learning or minimize teaching? I bet you that the okay. attendings would say, well, they I don't have as much time I to can't, teach, but they're I guess, learning by watching. I guess the um, reason I said learning is because uh, in my mind, um, uh, correcting errors in a particular way, is you correct them, you learn from them. Now, uh, and that, of course, indirectly means somebody has to correct it, or somebody has to implicate. So that's teaching. So I guess it is teaching as well. But I guess I didn't talk about teaching is because I didn't focus on that particularly. I, it would mean teaching. You don't have enough time for teaching, therefore you don't have time to learn. Because uh, one clinician at, um, at ICU in Columbia who was very verbal about these things, who worked with me, his name is Desmond Jordan. He worked with me for a number of years of Columbia work. He had no bones about it. He said, if you don't have time, I don't care. We're still going to go over it. He would just go on and on, and, and his dialogue would be very animated, and language would be sometimes difficult to transcribe. <laughs> and you know, just <laughs> would go on and say, no, this is not right, you can't do it, and would go. But then they'll always be running late for everything, and they would be complaining and not making time. So you know, there's a trade-off here, and uh, we definitely is an opportunity lost if we don't capture. Uh, what I was getting at, I think, mm -hmm. is this this notion on the part of many really busy clinicians that they don't have time to teach. Right. Sure. But if follow me around, because you'll learn a lot by watching me. You yeah. see that kind of mm -hmm. notion that they believe that there's learning going yeah. on, even if they don't have time to be explicitly teaching. And I, I, so I just was trying yeah. to distinguish. So maybe you're right. It's like about the, the, the counterpart of it. And if, mm -hmm. if you're doing something and if you're making a mistake and say, uh, you know, you just learn by watching. But if they make a mistake and say, oh, no, that's not how it's done. Do something else. Then you learn from it. But most often these things are implicit. They're not explicit. Therefore, you can't, you know, observation has a limitation. That's, so this is one. So how do you characterize with some of these kinds of things? We really have to go, if you go back to the Oslerian tradition, you know, you learn by so many, by feel, touch, smell, all kinds of things, that when it comes back to that, this real environment creates this. The naturalistic environment in the wilderness of ICU create opportunity for clinical team to detect and correct errors as compared to non-naturalistic. So most errors were un you know, corrected in this particular case. So something really goes on there. You know, we, we analyze the data from a particular perspective. There's a lot more information there. If you just to, uh, clinicians are going to focus down on the medical aspect of it right now to say which ones really are errors and which were quite serious, which could have implication, could it be an alternative to it, that kind of writing a paper that has a more clinical slant to it. But this is very interesting, the third paper. So it's a team of three papers that kind of give you so basically, the summary and conclusions of all of that is that team perform better than individuals, okay, just for no sure, in detecting and correcting errors through collaboration. So we could show that two people, three people interacting in a dialogue, one person made a mistake, another one didn't pick it up, but third person quickly said, hold on here, didn't you say that? That's not exactly right. Or somebody will say something and third person will say, maybe we could add this to the person. So you could actually track. You can actually count. If you wanted to go through and count number of times, it provides a real empirical evidence that teams make a difference that individuals do not to that extent. Okay, this really is the you can actually count those numbers, and it, it's so it has a real empirical number of times it happens. So teams provide error checks. There's no question. Teams perform better at detecting knowledge base and complex errors than simple procedural errors. Remember, these are constraints of ICU. Okay, most are ICU and trauma. Now, <coughs> is this going to hold in uh, another uh, place, ER, or even uh, normal wards? We don't know. 
But under these constraints of the complex environment, this is knowledge base is much more clearly picked up. Um, because they're talking, they're explicating. You know. So these are under the assumptions that this is something more generic. With greater discussion and elaboration, new errors get generated. Many were corrected, but still escaped. Very interesting. When I was years ago testing um, the role of traditional medical education and problem-based <coughs> learning, two universities, a medical school, McGill in Montreal and McMaster in Toronto. And um, we looked at it, and one of the critical findings was that McGill was very traditional. Therefore, they had, um, they did not explicate detail. They didn't talk very much while they were solving the clinical problem. They went quickly to the, to the end product and said, okay, this is the diagnosis and this is the management. They very much mimicked the experts in the field. Uh, they made fewer errors uh, most often. They got correct diagnosis most often. But when they made a mistake, it was a big one. And because they didn't get corrected very easily. Okay? And McMaster University, where they had a problem-based learning, these people went on and on and on and on. Wouldn't make a diagnosis. There was you know, five or six month differential long dialogue and they made mistakes themselves and they corrected it themselves as they were talking, saying, oh, yeah, maybe I won't, I don't, I don't want to do that, I want to go back again. So corrected themselves went on and on. There's a lot of learning going on. Lot. So more they talked, the more learning was going on for them, but the performance at the end was suboptimal. So what happened is that more discussions, more elaborate and promote learning, interfere with utility of the performance at that time. So, but uh, people who performed well, did very well, they didn't have opportunity to learn so much. If they make a mistake, it would be quite serious. Correct. So we have to have a balance here somewhere. How can we capitalize? How can we use technology? We develop simulations, certain things that we can provide for learning to support, to support learning, not only support uh, learning and teaching, and support that as, uh, as much as we support decision support for decision making. I think it's just as important because this is the environment. This is the learning environment. Discussions help detect errors, but also give rise to errors that are not have to be monitored. Role of knowledge-based experts in real world becomes very important. Difference between competent performance and learning and teaching rounds. A need to develop tools to support learning as well as decision making, and create a environment where you can. Uh, I know it's easier said than done. Be transparent about near misses, able to record it, and then have even at McGill we used to have ICU used to have once a week rounds. Uh, a special rounds at 4 o'clock on Fridays or Thursdays when any near misses that are critical that you can learn from would be given. One of them was uh, giving a streptokinase to a person who had a very severe chest pain in the ER and uh, this person was supposed to go to, s chances that he might go to surgery later, that he could bleed subsequently, but the, despite the regulation, despite the, he violated, the physician gave streptokinase, patient stabilized, everything was fine. But should he have given that? And the question was, was it really correct, given the guideline, given everything? The hospital could have been liable. So this was a, like a, everybody got together, a big dialogue and discussion. So there's a, there's a, and we analyzed that many years ago, to show how much learning goes on. Create an opportunity for independent learning as well, creating simulations of where they can learn from. But simulations that mimic what happens in the real world, not what happens in the, in kind of uh, the other uh, semi-naturalistic or naturalistic environment. Just to acknowledge the James Monk McDonald Foundation to me, and uh, the, fund, the fund was given originally when I was here, so it was given to ASU and to BMI actually, and it continues now to another year and a half. And these are all the people, Trevor Korn who was with me, <coughs> Alisa Shine worked with me, and works with me in Columbia, <coughs> from Columbia to New York Academy of Medicine. Sahiti Maineni came from, Colum uh, from ASU, she was my student here and she now is doing PhD at uh, UTH, University of Texas, Houston. Suchita Batwara is an MD from India, and she did a research fellowship with me at uh, University of Texas, Houston, and now she is in uh, University of Ohio doing residency. Tipti has moved on to more research uh, endeavors. Bella Patel is an ICU physician. Khalid is a ICU physician. Bafa Gemagami is also an ICU physician, trauma physician. William Wilkinson is a, did a master's here with me. He was a master's student. He, he wrote a paper right now recently on dialysis and errors in dialysis. He, was, he completed a master's from that work in, in patient safety. Uh, he's in, in Tucson. 
Uh, Sujita has also moved down to another, Sarojina has moved down to another area. She's back in India. Joanna Alson's in California now. She was a nurse student here. And Evan Gilmore is, was my research assistant for one year. He's just gone to McGill, McGill University now to take up a position as a, as, as a graduate student. So these are my current students. Most of them are students, clinician team, and they overlap between ISU, BMI here, Texas, uh, Columbia, and which shows I don't let go. I'm gonna <laughs> hold on to them. I'm a grandmother, you know, academic grandmother. <laughs> okay, with that, I wanna say thank you. Just to show you that we, um, the kind of system, I'm still the stickler for systematically doing studies, stay with it, an example of something that you could really stay with it, because each one gives you something there. And these data can stay for a long time. You can look at different aspects of the data. You know, at this point in time, it, it, what's interest to us is what, what we were interested in. But if you look at another perspective, you can actually start looking at something quite different. So it has a lot of value and a lot of interesting things. So they are very valuable and different codings and different data don't go away. I analyze data which is 10, 15 years old still, so if we can. Well, kind of in that vein, are you doing any work on identifying the optimal team composition? No, no. Okay. no. Uh, that, that's an interesting, actually, that would be very nice, and we'll have to set up controls as to what teams might be best. And so I don't know how in real world one would set that up, you know, because a team is a team. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but we could do numbers. You know, but one thing we all do find is that when they have more women, there is a lot more dialogue. A lot more errors get corrected, but they also get generated. So there is, but when there are more males, it's less of a dialogue. So I don't know what all that means, but there is definitely. So we could look at team variation and look at the characteristics of this team variation and come up with what may be a possibility, you know? And, but we could go more than one, year, one hospital they might be better because this is, right now we have limited and, and also the type of teams they work with. Not all teams are the same. Right. You know, some team, even the days, the two or three days we did, one team was bigger than the other teams. You know, so we haven't looked at it, what's the big difference between the two teams in that sense. But that will be interesting to do, definitely. Yeah. Um, I was interested in the types of errors that were occurring in the, um, uh, you know, in the three settings that you had. Right. And, um, First of all, you know, were the ones that were caught and corrected uh, less serious, more serious? Uh, you yes. Know, um, also, uh, were there situations where several errors occurred because the first error occurred? In other words, cascaded errors rather right. than right, um, right. You know, that that's a very did you do those kinds of analyses? Yeah, yeah. So we we haven't got that far completely yet. What we did do, we identified all the errors in terms of which were slips and which were really conceptual errors. Now, somebody said, you know, that's not exactly meant. I mean, you know, it's just I, I mean, like you had, uh, you recorded an error if somebody said something wrong and then corrected themselves. Yes. But errors that, of something that they do Slip. versus something that they say might be more serious. You know, like if they actually gave a wrong medication well, or something. Well, the thing is that, um, so there isn't too much you do at the moment while the, in the rounds in this particular no, state. I guess let's say, you're right, I understand mm -hmm. that, but if let's say the team leader says uh, this person should be on such and such medication, and so gets they recorded. Gave an order. Yes, yes, so yes, this is what we meant by error propagation. Mm -hmm. It actually got in, mm -hmm. in the chart. Now, how many of them have serious consequences and not? We haven't got that far yet. We're doing this, this is what clinicians are doing right now. Which ones will really make a big difference? Or which ones will make a difference, but perhaps not too much. Now, that's what we want to track. And also, since we know the patient, what exactly happened over a period of time, we can track it. And so that's what they are doing. We need access to protocols and things that we don't anymore have because yeah. they're different hospitals, but they are doing it right now. But we do know they do get, pro they do get propagated, they do get in, into the chart, into the chart, because people are recording, because they're moving forward as they're doing it. So which ones would be serious and which ones would not? That's an interesting. I think that's, that's always been a particular interest in that way, yeah. I think you have an additional threat at the teaching uh, hospital because the thing that you said that is incorrect, it might not get into the chart now, it might not be an order that's taken now, but you just taught someone yeah. to do something that they can make that error later. That's right. You could, yeah, you could do that. Do, do you mean even catching someone putting it in? 
if the no team leader states an incorrect fact yep. that now uh, you know is taken by the resident as uh, yes the way to do things and then later on uh, absolutely you know, absolutely so chart, it's yeah, yeah it's a latent thing you know so this the other thing is that latent flaws which not immediately salient but over a period of time it becomes so that's another thing that Trevor was looking at the latent identification what happened over a period of time because he's still in Texas so he still has access to that so he's looking at the latent flow that's going on in that information so that's because continuation of that particular team that patient chart that's the charting. It's not always easy to get access to it, but we're looking at that one. That's important because not quite salient in this moment, but skips gets in and eventually gets transformed into something. And and they don't. Um, uh, people usually take attendings word as serious. They take notice of it. Resident, they ignore the intern. And so one of the errors that was completely ignored. That's uh, there's ten. The nine was picked up and one was not resolved. That was picked up by an intern. So you can see in the dialogue, intern picked it up, and they just didn't was ignored and kind of went along, that kind of thing. So they, we don't have enough, but there's some hierarchical things also going on there, you know. So that's the other thing is that right. my, that error might have been corrected, but it didn't get corrected. So that kind of yeah, I think that that's an issue in the, that crew resource management you're talking about coming out of avi aviation is that the assertive communication to actually step up and that's say right. that's wrong. Yes, <coughs> that's or absolutely that, true. I think that might be wrong. <coughs> absolutely true, yeah. It's interesting. So now, so basically this is one thread going on. What I'd like second thing to do is how many of this thing or how much of this is quite generic that's also in, in a, other areas, in military. Military is another place. Military, aviation, kinds of things. I mean, in leadership is very important in military and that kind of to see what extent they play a role here. Well, this question of hierarchy, I mean, the Korean Airlines yeah. uh, incident was a famous one, you know. Where oh, absolutely. So this, so I want to see how much is generic overall, and then narrow down to some of the questions that you were asking. We're also interested in, um, so quite interesting is the errors that were complex, the most excellent corrected. A simple that kind of went through, which is kind of counterintuitive to me, but it seemed to be more complex. Uh, maybe they're, they're focusing more on it, maybe more alert to it because they're complex or simple, they don't focus on it. I don't know what the reason is. But more complex <coughs> there are, less chances are. Which raises a whole other host of issue that, uh, and it's mostly done very quickly on the fly. It's not carefully constrained, thought about very quickly. They don't think they kind of, if you don't really analyze the detail, you can't even pick it. It just moves through. You know, this is why we, earlier studies we're not able to pick it up because we don't notice it. There are a lot of details there, kind of very interesting. Uh, but right now it's just picked up on three generic things, but we're interesting to pick. A number of lessons here. One is that you can be systematic about the studies, you can talk about the teams, you can talk about the nature of errors, uh, the seriousness of the errors of propagation, uh, what, is it, what, are, what, what phenomena are very generic that applies to many things, what kind of opportunities there are for developing tools, supporting things in a particular way, how can we develop, now we're doing the virtual reality one, which is trying to have the exactly same team's composition, in trying to train them to ask questions, same, same, giving them errors and trying to see if they can correct something, and creating an environment to learn, particularly in that way. So that's kind of thing is also another important thing. And finally, methods of data collection and analysis. We're getting sophisticated day by day in methods of data collection and analysis because what I used to do, I don't do anymore. We got much more sophisticated. So we always have to keep updated on it. So it less. Uh, but we still have this massive amount of data. So we call ethnography, which is collect completely. Uh, if there's an opportunity, what we call cognitive, ethno cognitive ethnography, which is focusing down on specific as aspect of it and then asking questions, probing. It comes out of original child psychology or Piaget's child probing thing, that you ask questions so that the qu responses are narrow. But in a natural, real environment, you can't do that very much, but you can create a condition which is natural, yet it's not completely constrained. So you've got to think of new ideas or way of doing things that will give you as close approximation as possible, if not, because you lose something in one, gain by the other. I didn't catch this, but did, were there a lot of interruptions with these teams? Interruptions? Did, did you capture yes, that? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So when there are time periods when there is uh, more errors generated, we, we don't know what it was, but in other studies we have shown exactly the same. Not only interruptions, 
But the two kinds of things that make a difference in different ways. One is how often you are taken away from the team. Another, another one is how long you are away. So you might be taken away many times, but not that long. Nurses and clinicians, the, the physicians, usually different. Nurses are taken away much more often, but for shorter periods of time. When clinicians are taken away, it's another patient next to, you know, interruption. So it's a, it's a very, so that has been definitely shown to really affect. It would be very nice to show in these kinds of studies when exactly they were interrupted mm -hmm. and when exactly it made a difference. Mm -hmm. Did any of them affect the near misses or the misses pass of it, you know? To actually track those. And it would be, I don't know if data is rich enough to do that, but if it is, we could look at it, team. But we did, did look at ER interruptions and made a big difference whether it was in the three or four places that made a huge difference. And the, the length of the, so coming, if you're away long enough, then you come back, you've got to start again where you left off. It's, it's difficult. The short interruption is just really nuisance, a nuisance to the team, and just, inter just interrupting. It's different kind of, it has different kind of impact on the discussion. Mm -hmm. But we haven't looked at it in this data, but that is a possibility. I don't know how rich the data is to be able to look at that kind of thing. That's an important, important consideration. You remember that e in ICU, you know, you can't just say let's reduce the interruptions completely because sometimes they say you you need to be interrupted, otherwise some other patient will die. You know, so it's um, it's it's, a, it's tricky. It's a trade-off of so many things. So there is no such thing as just get rid of the arrows, get rid of this completely. This is interfering. It's, it's kind of juggling. It's a world of negotiations. Subtle negotiation, so which really comes out of the fact that they have to be trained in judgment and decision making. It becomes very important how to make judgment call because you ask for judgment call every second. So ability to make judgment, judgment call. I think this is what it comes down to, as as far as I think anyway. For the data collection, you have a you have your your person is essentially a member of the team going around with the team. Yes. Uh, and more or less ignored. I mean, you, you don't think yeah. there's a lot of Hawthorne effect stuff here, yeah. so they just have a tape recorder with them. Yes, and, they have a tape recorder. Nowadays, it's very minute. Yeah. So they carry it unobtrusively. Uh, we go there two or three times before, so they get used to us having our, us around. And then the first time we have to announce, it's so required by Institutional Review Board, we announce that the attending will announce, or the nurse will announce, the that um, you will see these people around here. We're doing studies with them. We are, we are not studying them. We are collaborators. Very make it quite clear. This is not studying them, collaborators. We're working with you, so um, we are going to, we're going to see them around. Just continue as normal, and then we're around there a few <coughs> times, and they get used to us after that. And then, uh, uh, then the nursing staff will go a separate bit, and they will tell them that they want all the blanket approval that's okay for us to be there. If anybody's not comfortable, we will either not have that person there or we will not record that team. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. It's absolutely, that's how institution wanted it. That's how we had it. We never had any issues. That's interesting. But we were prepared to back off when we had to. And same thing for resident. Uh, I would go both places and give a talk and tell them why we're doing it, give them papers, educate them a little bit, follow them. If anybody had difficulty, we would talk to them, discuss them. So, so yes, the team member will be inside, uh, always recording. So one will be recording, one will be just taking notes to any personal dynamics or things. Yeah, so two. Go two, two at each time. So it sounds like your sense is that what you were observing was pretty normal and not influenced by your I think that's unusual. So everybody, process. if somebody is just always keeping an eye on the, you know, observer or somebody else, particularly, you can pick that up very quickly, or somebody will answer, give a response and look at the. Uh, person who is recording, then you know that is something a little bit difficult, you know. We can't videotape. We could videotape a bit to do much better of what they're exactly doing. But we have enough recorders. And these people have been trained, particularly trained to do that. And we have now developed a, a taxonomy in the iPad to check for those things, particularly as well. Kind of thing. It makes it easier, a little bit clearer. And also, these can be trans then they be transcribed. They can easily transport into a computer before we had to do this big, long writing, you know, stuff. So things become a little easier. Analysis become a little easier with new technologies of, of parsing text, and we do that. And we're getting better and better, trying to use a little better technology each time, make it easier, making sure we don't lose. Do 